I actually started out in Landcare 25 years ago when I um, was preparing for this and you don't often reflect back and count the years uh, that you've been on this earth and at what point you might have done certain significant things. But 25 years ago I, I actually formed a school Landcare group. I was in high school at the time in the Albury region and um, we went out and did revegetation to halt gully erosion and uh, it was a mechanism to engage with my peers in the school and also to engage with uh, natural resource management which I was very passionate about and continue to be. 17 years ago I moved across to Western Australia and became a land care coordinator in the Shire of Victoria Plains in, a town of Kaling in the town of Kalingri which is 130 people including the dogs. And the task there was to grow engagement in land care, on ground impacts, partnerships, um, and to do anything, whatever tickled their, you know, an individual's fancy, I could uh, couch that up into land care and engage people. Just under 13 years ago, I started with the Birchup Cropping Group, moved to Victoria, and which you've just heard about from Carolyn. And I did that to broaden my understanding of land care from a production focus. I'd had a very strong environmental focus in a traditional role as a land care coordinator in, in uh, WA. And I grew uh, with my, in my decade there, as did BCG, broadening out to have a range of uh, environmental and social uh, initiatives. These days I engage with, lo with land care locally in the Bendigo area where I um, purport to spend uh, my time. Uh, part of my time, and I work at a regional level, state level, uh, engage nationally through the Australian Land Care Council, and I'm involved in partnerships with local land managers, cultural custodians, regional authorities, government, corporates, and philanthropics. And it seems that navigating land care now is much more complex than when I first moved to WA as a land care coordinator. Today I'm actually going to th ask you to think about land care in the context of the Darwinian theory survival of the fittest. Now, I am a firm and passionate believer and advocate for land care, but I'm also a realist and I can be exceptionally critical, constructively critical. And I recognise that we can't rest on our laurels. So what is fittest? By fittest I mean fit for purpose, for a marathon, not a sprint. Fitness of a movement, of a land care group or a farmer group to survive the future. Now we know that there's plenty of communities that have not survived and you drive around rural and regional Australia there's always a historical marker of something that had been there in prior years. And there are many groups that are weary and battle scarred but Darwin also re recognised that barring a cataclysmic event and I think in one of the concurrent sessions they're talking about those, um, there will be survivors and thrivers. Strong, fit, adaptive and transformative will survive. Lanka has been fit enough to survive 25 years. It has achieved enormous impact, has been an unsung hero, initiated widespread movement, connected city and rural, changed landscapes, influenced practice, and has been exported around the world to 20 countries. Perhaps, however, it's also been the victim of its own success. I'd like to reflect on past experiences and challenge you to address the fitness of your group engage your business with land care and consider how you can help support independence for this movement. I'm going to talk about land care as Gen Y. Land care that has high brand awareness, exceptional awareness for these hands, but do you understand what they do? The multiple benefits of land care, do we actually articulate and measure and advocate for those? and the need for social capacity and social capital to, su to successfully navigate complexity. I'm going to talk about this in the national context and a rural and regional context. So I, I am, because of time, not touching on the phenomenal work that is done internationally and the high amount of work that happens in urban communities. So let's think about land care in generational terms. Gen Y. What is a typical Gen Y? commonly assumed to have an emphasis on extrinsic values such as money, fame and image, and less emphasis on intrinsic values such as self-acceptance, group affiliation and community. But they are confident, open-minded, tech-savvy, ambitious and they like to be liked, especially on Facebook. 
Some believe many Gen Ys have been rewarded for minimal accomplishments, such as mere participation, for example, and they have unrealistic expectations of working life. Anyone in a Gen X or baby boomers here will be nodding about the challenges. Anyone in a Gen Y will say, yeah, but we're good, and we don't need to worry. Your average 25-year-old these days still lives at home. Well, mine do. They hanker for the benefits of adulthood, but are not keen to take on full responsibility. They delay some of the typical adulthood rites of passage, like marriage or starting a career. But then the socio-economic landscape makes it financially challenging to meet expectations and move out of home. I ask, is the group thing less sexy now, given that we have online relationships and, and generally ignore our neighbour, and we all seem to have a consultant or life coach? Have we started applauding just because there are 6,000 landcare groups and over 150 farmer groups across the country, without worrying about the impact they may or may not have? Have we, re have we rewarded landcare for not taking risks to move out of home by drip feeding it with government support, but tie them up in layers of bureaucracy and paperwork so that there is no time to explore other supporters? It's not just a task for Gen Y to explore and create opportunities. It's also the responsibility for the parents, National Farmers Federation, Australian Conservation Foundation and government to initiate the challenging conversations and support succession. Every farmer knows the challenges of succession planning, but we all recognise how critical it is to get it right. What does a 25-year-old do to consolidate that great start that its parents have provided the first quarter century, and to fly rather than to peter out and fade away. In the latest edition of Landcare in Focus, the National Landcare Facilitator Brett De Heer is quoted as saying, Landcare is now a movement made up of hundreds of thousands of people across the country, from the city to the bush, old and young. As a movement of many organisations, governments and individuals, it is controlled by nobody and owned by all. A question to reflect on, is Landcare at risk of reinventing tragedy of the commons, where each of us thinks the other is taking care of it and giving it priority? I was speaking with an agribusiness rep recently, who happens to be uh, here at the conference as well, about Landcare. A great brand, he said. We should all be involved. But I actually struggle to understand what Landcare does and how my business can engage. This philosophy, movement and practice has exceptional brand awareness. We know these hands. But does it have a depth of understanding? And can it have that depth of understanding in the modern complex world? 76% of surveyed land managers in 2012 said Landcare needed to evolve a clear message about the desire for future innovation. Now we all crave simplicity on the far side of complexity, but can we simplify or reduce land care that much? Reality for rural communities is complex and uncertain. The vagaries of the weather, seasons and climate, of which we've had our fair share in recent times, the myths and maze of marketing, the intricacies of intelligent input purchases and decisions, Attracting and, training and retaining services, volunteering for everything, keeping gardens alive and staying connected. The reality for many of us in rural and regional communities is having a plethora of information and advisors, banks, accountants, succession planners, agronomists, communication and community development staff, business consultants, let alone husbands, wives, neighbours, media and your gut instinct and past experience. We are overwhelmed with information, all to be consumed now, adopted now, the value of the research assessed now, and moving on to something else now. We all seek to simplify things. We create sieves to ensure the crap stays out and the rigour stays in. For farmers, those sieves are increasingly the consultant and the local discussion groups, landcare groups or farming systems groups. As Caroline said, farmer attention is scarce seeking information relevant to the current context and close to home, looking for the relative advantage of one decision over another, ultimately seeking profitability and sustainability across the entire business and not just decisions related to growing or raising the product alone. New information and practices need to be locally validated and tested 
demonstrate it works, make sure it ticks off the quadruple bottom line, environmental, economic, social and political. Farmers do not adopt without good evidence and support. I believe Landcare needs rigour in knowing its capacity in designing and creating initiatives that will have impact and influence. Relevance to ensure actions are appropriate to the issue and community. Relationships that inspire us to foster a network that builds on success and learns from failures and the past. In the reality of increasing complexity and uncertainty, partnerships, relationships and collaborations are crucial to developing innovation to meet our needs and aspirations. Now, partnerships see us sharing ideas, constraints and solutions, harnessing the collective capacity plus the occasional odd bod. But how do we decide who to partner with? Now, successful groups like BCG sought partners that complemented their skill set, someone that had street cred and a reputation for delivering. A challenge is that we often know the locals, those in the same sector as ourselves. Landcare knows landcare, industry knows industry. So we don't think about partnering those that we do not know or don't have any relationship with. We need people to inspire us and to inspire our industries to change and build change. We are all guilty of sticking with our favourite people, those that we work with easily. 25 years ago, Landcare was the result of different stakeholders partnering with the enemy, NFF and ACF at the time. Could we actually do that now? What is Landcare now? 6,000 groups, 56 regional authorities, state and territory governments, national entities and 20 countries around the world. I'm picking up on the practice, movement and philosophy. It is bigger than the original context and concept. It has grown organically, but it requires a breadth and depth of partnerships to nourish it. It also requires a sophisticated approach to articulate what it can offer, segmenting its market and establishing smart partnerships. Long-term, multifaceted partnerships with funders, critical thinkers, policy makers, doers, in order to banter, analyse and critique innovations, products, tools and processes, and logic. Moulding and shaping great ideas to create a practice that makes good business sense and supports viable and innovative communities. Landcare has changed the face of Australian agriculture, not just in the landscape, but in the way extension and adoption are structured, via groups. Now in 2020, a National Landcare Survey reported that 73% of Australian farmers said they were part of some type of agriculture related group, and that the largest grouping was local land care and farming systems groups. Land care was arguably the popular birth of groups as a model for extension and adoption. The results of that survey indicate that group delivery remains important to the majority of Australian farmers. Group delivery has over time become specialised and segmented as farmers have focused on the type of group that best meets their needs. Some groups focus on a narrow specific set of issues and others take a wider approach using the group structure to uh, best meet their needs. This is a slide I meant to show you. One of these is uh, originally says men and the other one says women. I'll let you choose under the, those that are the uh, single focus, multi-focus that I've used to hide those names. Now, one third of farmers who took part in local land care groups and farming systems groups cited these reasons for participating. There we go. Information tailored to local conditions and issues, hands-on field days that are locally relevant, social networks, and the opportunity to see what others are doing. We always like to look over the fence. The what's in it for me concept, in action. Partnerships between farmers, conservationists and government are evolving to partnerships including business, community and in some cases philanthropy, an area I'm keen to grow. But are they evolving to the scale and maturity required? And then, how do we capture and measure the input and benefits each partner contributes or accrues from the partnership? Hold off a minute, Dennis. If we can't articulate these, we certainly can't measure them. Our understanding of land here in Australia is missing a vital component. And although the environmental and agricultural outcomes have been well explored, the many other benefits of land care and the natural resource management beyond these domains have, for the most part, been anecdotally acknowledged. 
Recognising this, in 2013, the Australian Land Care Council commissioned a piece of work, the multiple benefits of land care, to establish the extent of the evidence base and how to build this further into a more robust case for investment into land care. Education. There are six areas of uh, multi-benefits. Education, which has been well established and understood. And there are a range of positive educational outcomes for individual, in, for example, continuous learning and skill development, through to the broader community with spreading awareness and delivering innovation. Land care and pharma groups offer both formal and informal educational mechanisms. Social and community health and wellbeing, a complex array of benefits, but quite considerable. Land care and pharma groups not only provide a venue, an avenue for very real connection with the natural environment, but also lead to increased levels of social networking and, part and participation, both of which can contribute to physical and mental wellbeing. The agricultural and environmental outcomes of land care, a healthier living environment, also contribute to healthy individuals and communities. Political and social capital, a vital part of social fabric, fabric and absolutely critical for community fitness and future prosperity. The, the dynamic social relationships and cohesion that develop through land care and pharma groups can form an intrinsic part of social fabric, in many cases filling gaps in community beyond the agricultural and environmental domain, particularly for regional and rural communities, with enhanced social capacity and cohesion, stronger local governance, increased recognition of women in rural communities, and self-empowerment and fulfilment. Economic, a considerable set of numbers, not just the numbers of fences and trees. Land care can generate an economic return in the, or, in the order of two to five times the original investment. And this economic benefit arises through access to labour, equipment, expertise and training, financial assistance and increased farm profitability. The scale of economic return is important within land care contributing to individuals as well as regions. Cultural benefits, increasing connections in new ways that are very old. Significant benefits accrue from connection with country, which has spiritual, social, physical and mental health, particularly for Indigenous communities. And resilience. Resilient individuals, communities and landscapes are the, are the end state of the multiple benefits of land care and groups. Resilience arises through the multiple benefits being evident, heavily integrated, interdependent and mutually reinforcing, and incorporate many of the key elements that research suggests enhance resilience. Land care promotes the formation of networks that allow communities to support each other and can provide services beyond the agricultural and environmental domain when faced with adversity. So, we know there are multiple benefits from the land care movement and philosophy. My question is, are we mature and experienced enough to leverage these multiple benefits in order to strengthen grassroots land care? But we're operating in a competitive space and attracting people to take the time to understand land care and experience the benefits is challenging. On reflection, the loss of critical resources, the introduction of layers of bureaucracy to feed off this successful model, changes in the world around us created an environment where land care went into survival mode and to some extent is now in endurance mode. To prep for this particular talk, I put a call out on Twitter seeking views on land care. The vast majority of responses were from people who felt disconnected from a movement they had been associated with, who felt land care had lost its focus on productive agriculture, sustainable ag agriculture, and had cushioned the interaction between practical land care and the larger land care authorities and programs. With the renewed focus on productivity, as strongly articulated at this conference, land care needs to consider what, if any, unintended consequences will impact, positive or negative. Is land care recognised as an enabler to achieve productivity? And if so, do we invest in capacity? The future seems a long marathon and fitness of groups and communities due to all the things I've mentioned are amplified. What is land care? How does it have relationships in the age of 140 characters? How does it, or how do we, deliver consumable and relevant content in an ancient landscape? Can land care leverage this age of brevity, a symptom of the busyness of our modern day worlds? Yes, it can. Land care is a species capable of surviving and thriving if we train for fitness and improve our fitness for the marathon and the train that we have in our landscape around us. 
as farming and land and sea management systems become more varied and multifunctional and the processing and delivery chains become more complex, we need networks and improved tools to aid decision making. Information that does not reduce complexity and uncertainty is useless. Why? Because uncertainty is a major constraint to decision making. It results in paralysis and conservatism, sticking to what we know, or in desperate decisions and actions, adopting wacky ideas as a way to find the solution. And there are many responses to complexity. Some of you, these you'll do yourself at times and others apply to organisations. We avoid delay or defer a decision. We take steps to reduce uncertainty by collecting more and more and more information. We avoid by complexity by reducing the decision to something that is just good enough rather than best. We can focus on incremental measures rather than those that fundamentally change things. And we seek to reduce conflict of interest or perceptual differences by talking, and hence the term all talk and no action. If we want healthy industries in the future, we need organisations and information that assists decision makers, farmers, landscape managers or policy makers, whoever they may be, by reducing uncertainty and complexity. And this is a role for a fit land care group and a land care movement and a philosophy. Farm and land management will increasingly demand information for multiple functions. So being clear on the multi benefits and not leaving them to others to claim and deliver on is a lever. I'm not saying that this is easy. Darwin did not call it survival of the fittest because it was easy. There will be casualties and our maturity as a land care movement and practice will determine if we learn and adapt from those losses. We have innovation, intellect, creativity and commitment in our communities and dare I say it, in the people who make up government departments and in land care. Let's harness it build new partnerships with deeper understanding of what land care can facilitate and train ourselves to be fit for purpose and continue the amazing legacy that is and will be land care. Thank you very much.